I think that we need a refresher on Reebok, because I'd say that they've fallen on some tough times. They haven't been relevant for 10, 15 years. Most would argue that their peak was 20, 30 years ago. They're just not cool today, not like they used to be. Very few people are bragging about buying their new pair of Reeboks. In fact, a good portion of their sales now comes from their line of classic shoes, which I'm sure they'd spin it in a different way, but it's really just a way of capitalizing on their former popularity. They were so big and so awesome before that the best way they can sell shoes today is to remind everyone of those good times. Let me highlight some of those good times. In 1988, Reebok was said to be the number one athletic brand in the United States and number two throughout the world behind only Adidas. In the world of basketball, at times arguably it was the biggest brand out there. In 1992, they signed a young up and coming NBA player named Shaquille O'Neal to an endorsement contract, meaning that one of the greatest basketball players ever to play the game spent a good portion of his career backing Reebok. In 1996, they did the same thing with a young player named Allen Iverson. Then in 2001, they signed a deal with the NBA, making them the exclusive supplier of the uniforms for most of the teams, and a couple years later, it was extended to every team. So if you watch any NBA game from, say, 2003, all the uniforms were made by Reebok. Looking at the world of football, it's the same thing. Numerous endorsements around that time, and again, they were the exclusive supplier of their uniforms. That deal included all of the replica jerseys and a lot of the other NFL clothing. So for years, Reebok supplied all the uniforms to two of the largest sports leagues in the United States. It wasn't contained to that either. They had major involvement in basically any sport. For the Olympics in 1996, held in Atlanta, Reebok claims that one third of all the athletes were wearing their stuff. It was even outside of sports. Survivor, that show was insanely popular when it debuted and Reebok was a sponsor that provided all their clothes and shoes for the cast and crew. I think I've proven my point. From the late 80s to the early 2000s, Reebok was everywhere. Yet today, they're practically non-existent in any major sports league or anywhere, really. So let's look closer into this brand and try to figure out what happened. Reebok goes way back and has a few different beginnings. It actually has roots going back to 1890s England. It was started by this guy named J.W. Foster, who named the company after himself. Then, in the 1950s, two of his grandsons started their own shoe company that specialized in running shoes that was called Reebok and eventually took over the company that their grandfather had started. But comparatively, all of that is small stuff. 1979 is when big things started to happen. That's when Reebok took some of their running shoes and showed them off in a sporting goods show in Chicago. Attending this show was a man involved in the business of camping supplies named Paul Fireman. He was impressed by the shoes Reebok was offering, stayed in touch, and within a few months, acquired the rights to sell their shoes in the United States. Things weren't very fast at first, as should be expected. To raise money, he even ended up selling over half of his company to a separate British shoemaker with the condition that he would remain in charge. In 1982, everything changed when they found their market. See, in that year, aerobics was becoming a huge fad and Reebok saw an opportunity. And if you don't know, aerobics is all this stuff. <laughs> Jane Fonda was known for popularizing it and eventually everyone was putting out their own tapes. Reebok's idea was if you wanna sell running shoes, there's a lot of competition. But if you wanna sell aerobic shoes, you'd be just about the only one. So, they released the first ever shoe where the design, the materials, the fit, the appearance were all specifically made for aerobics. The shoe was called Freestyle. Initially, they paired it with a promotion offering free classes with Richard Simmons and it just put them on the map. Over the next few years, they had millions in sales, primarily due to these shoes. And remember, to this point, Reebok is still a small shoe company in England. All of this success was happening in the United States. States, where Paul Fireman had the rights to sell their shoes. So in 1984, the US company bought the initial Reebok company for $700,000. Then famously in 1985, Sybil Shepard, a big celebrity at the time, wore them to the Emmys, apparently indicating that they had made their way into women's fashion. In the next year, 1986, here's what I suspect happened. They looked at their sales mix and saw that they were doing really well when it came to women's aerobic shoes, but not really anything else. 
Those shoes made up almost half their sales the year before, and they were nervous about being so reliant on one particular market, especially when they suspected that the whole aerobics thing may have been a bit of a fad, which we now know it basically was, and that meant that at any moment their sales could have a significant drop, and they'd be mostly unable to control it. With all of these concerns, they felt pressure to utilize their name recognition and other resources to diversify. They expanded into just about every other market that made sense. All in 1986, they started making sports clothing, you know, not just shoes, but actual clothing, sports accessories, a line of children's shoes with a name that I can't say without laughing. Here it goes, Wee Bucks. <laughs> And we can't forget the basketball shoes. Also, in 1986, the logo changed. It used to be, I guess, just the Union Jack, the British flag, but they felt that this one was more active and better reflected the athletic image that they were trying to promote. The following year, they introduced walking shoes, tennis shoes, golf shoes, becoming really popular in all of it, meaning that they were now selling to men, women, children, a variety of products for a variety of activities. I would call that diversified. They also started acquiring other companies. In 1987 alone, they bought four other large shoemakers. And like I said, one year later, in 1988, all of these efforts made them the number one athletic brand in the country, with 1.79 billion in sales. And where would I be if I didn't mention this? In 1989, they introduced the Reebok Pump. You actually pump up the shoe, and the padding inflates, theoretically making it more comfortable and form-fitting. It's a little before my time, but I've always seen it as more of a gimmick than anything else. Let me know if you think otherwise. But by the way, here's a clip from the 1991 NBA Slam Dunk Contest. Oh, he's pumping his shoes up. Oh, there you go. <laughs> There's first of all, he's got the favorite right there. He's pumping up his shoes. They were promoted by Dominique Wilkins and Shaq and I guess just pop culture in general. Then I guess I've already talked about where they went from here. Endorsements, Olympics, in 97 they had the DMX series, league contracts, Survivor. I'm not going to say it was all perfect. They've always had identity issues concerning whether they're a sports brand, strictly a fitness brand, a fashion brand. All of those companies that they acquired had different images. In in 1992, they introduced a casual line called Box, but then in 1994, they announced they were transitioning strictly into a sports brand. Maybe it's because they became so successful so fast from so many different customers that they never had the chance to find their identity. So that may have held them back, but obviously not too much. Then we can't ignore Nike. Back in 1988, when Reebok was number one, Nike wasn't as much of a concern, but then they became huge, and that's bad for Reebok. But you have to consider that Nike was already huge in 2001 when Reebok was landing all of these league contracts. The NBA and the NFL went with Reebok instead, so the emergence of Nike may have pushed them from number one, but it didn't take them off the list. Here's Reebok's revenue, ranging from their number one spot in 1988 all the way to 2004. Now, the entire market grew, and if you were to collect data concerning market share, it would probably reflect something different, though their core market was always changing and questionable at times, but this is useful. Obviously a big drop there, maybe caused by some of the factors I mentioned, but the fact is, 2004 was their best selling year. The data stops there, because in 2005, all of Reebok was bought by Adidas. It cost them $3.8 billion, which was a 34% premium based on their stock price. The whole idea behind this acquisition was that Nike was just so far ahead, maybe combining these two will just help them catch up. So much for that plan, because starting about right here, Reebok's sales have really gone down. It's been the perception of many people, including myself, that Adidas has been promoting their own brand and just allowing Reebok to fail. It's hard to do comparisons of before and after the acquisition because everything's mixed together now and reported in euros since Adidas is from Germany, but here's my attempt. Using an approximate exchange rate from 2004, the Reebok sales from their last independent year equate to about 2.9 billion euros. In their first full year with Adidas in 2006, Reebok sales were reportedly just under 2.5 billion euros. That's a pretty significant decrease, and consider it was coming off of a growth period. In 2018, that number was well below 1.7 billion. But sales from Adidas branded products have tripled over that span. In 2006, 27% of their total revenue was from Reebok, and in 2018, that was down to 8%. There's so many variables that contribute to that, but maybe it could mean that the company 
has been focused on Adidas and willing to sacrifice Reebok. More potential evidence is that NBA contract. Reebok made a 10-year deal with the NBA in 2001, meaning it was meant to extend through 2011. Well, <laughs> I don't know the exact legality of it, but when Reebok was bought by Adidas, it somehow allowed for changes in that contract. The end result was in 2006, not even a year after the acquisition, Adidas signed an 11-year contract with the NBA to sponsor them and supply their uniforms. So effectively, everything shifted from Reebok to Adidas. It makes me think that Adidas was more interested in promoting their own brand rather than Reebok. They effectively took away five years of NBA promotion, which for a brand like this is significant. In 2014, the Reebok logo changed for a second time. It's now this Delta symbol meant to represent change. It's reflecting how they want to be seen as more of a fitness brand as opposed to a fashion or sports brand. Change, like <laughs> getting into shape, I suppose. The way I see this is they're backing up. CrossFit has been their new emphasis, along with yoga and still aerobics. Remember in the 80s, they exploded because they were able to transition from a very specific fitness market into a much more general market of sports. Well, <laughs> this is the exact opposite, from sports back to fitness. It just seems that whenever there's an opportunity in sports, Adidas would prefer if Adidas had it. So they've pushed Reebok back into their corner where there's less confliction. For years, there's been these rumors and conversation about Adidas potentially selling Reebok. I'm not alone in my theory, and many people think that Reebok's best chance in succeeding is pulling away from Adidas. In June of 2019, Shaquille O'Neal, the Diesel himself, who has a long history with Reebok, expressed interest in buying the brand. O'Neal said he wants to buy the athletic giant because he dislikes how its current owner, Adidas, has diluted the brand so much to where it's almost gone. I don't know if he can afford it, nor do I really see this happening anyway, but it shows his thoughts on the state of the brand. Let me know in the comments, is there any hope for Reebok? Are they going to come back in a big way? Are they going to go away completely? Or will they continue this strange path of classics and CrossFit? Nothing against CrossFit, but it'd be cool to see them doing more. Also, how has your perception of Reebok changed over time? Did you see them different in the 90s than you did the 80s, and is your perception of them today different than either of those? Personally, I used to think they were cool, but I just don't think of them anymore. They're so far off my radar that I didn't even realize that that logo changed in 2014 until just now. Let me know if that's the case for you too, along with any other thoughts you have about Reebok. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.